What brings you to, to the next day? So I'm actually coming home. We're at Sam Houston, Sam Houston High School, where I graduated some many years ago. And uh, it's nice to come home to uh, talk with students and try to inspire them to be, uh, be whatever they want to be. What kind of questions uh, do they ask you and what, what advice do you give to the, today's kids? Yeah, I think the most common question that people ask is what was it like to travel in space? And so I always talk about that uh, as an astronaut of uh, two uh, space flight missions, traveled over 7.2 million miles. I have a lot to say about that. And I use that as a platform in which to engage young people around inspiration and aspiration. Right? So it's, it's, it's great for us to inspire kids. That's what we do as astronauts. But also to uh, aspire them to be greater than themselves. To realize that there are things out there that they can do and only they can do. And uh, remind them who they are, which are these infinite beings with infinite possibilities. And, and did, you, did you ever believe as a, as a child that you would be going out into space? So it was uh, 50 years ago, actually, that uh, I first contemplated this idea of traveling in space. It was 1969 when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin went to the moon. And when I saw that, I was hooked. Listen, I was 13 years old. What is space feel like? I don't know what space feels yeah. like. What does it feel like up there? Well, in short, it takes only eight and a half minutes to get to work. So we launched from Florida, and when I got out of my seat eight and a half minutes later, we were traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. I wish from, went from being pushed back in my seat to three and a half times my weight of the acceleration of uh, getting into orbit to zero gravity in the second, and then I was there floating for the first time. I, I floated up to the window and I looked outside, I looked down to see the Earth, and it was a gorgeous sight to see. You know, at 17,500 miles an hour, we can travel around the world every 90 minutes, and we get to experience the sunset or sunrise every 45 minutes. So can you see beyond the Earth, or is it just... No, no, yeah. So if it's at night, you, if the heavens open up, you can see the stars of the Milky Way. In every direction that you turn, you can, you can see just this... this thousands, millions of lights out there, and realizing that in some of the regions, those are not just lights, they're not just other planets, they actual solar systems that are out there, and galaxies that are out there. So that kind of blows, blows your mind. It always blows my mind when I think about it. And when you're in space, you realize that the planet Earth is just one of those heavenly bodies amongst millions, and some people say billions, of other galaxies that are Wow. I heard, overheard the other reporter say about Mars. What, what do you think we're at? at? Yeah. So right now, traveling above us at 17,500 miles an hour is the International Space Station with crews in orbit uh, constantly. I want you to think about this. Never going forward, there will never be a time in human history that will not have a human presence in space. We're starting with the International Space Station, which, of course, NASA put in place. We now have private industry that's now taking us back and forth, picking up equipment, taking up humans into space. And around 2024, there's an Artemis program, which is the lunar program, where we'll actually have humans going to space. This time, it will not just be men, it will be men and women from many different ethnic backgrounds that participate in this. This is a first. And that will be the staging ground for going to Mars. And that's just to, to, to explore our solar system. So do you, do you, do you believe we, we will populate Mars? Uh, I believe that one day, uh, in probably a few generations, we will not only be living on the moon, but we'll be living permanently on Mars. So one, last, one last question. Could you see San Antonio from space? <laughs> yes, I could see San Antonio from space, uh, but only at night, because we're 250 miles above the Earth. And so during the day, you really can't see cities, per se. 
But at night, when you're passing over, you see the lights of the city. And there are, are a couple of things that kind of stand out. But I should say, you know, human-made things. The Great Wall of China is one. And the pyramids, the pyramids are another. But you can only see them during certain times of day, during either sunrise or sunset, because of the shadow that they cast on those structures. So how did you pick out San Antonio to space? Well, that's pretty easy, because you can see where the Gulf Coast is, you can see the lights of Houston, and you can come about 200 miles just west of Houston, and that big, bright area is San Antonio, Texas, <laughs> my hometown. Thank you. Anything else you want to add? Thank you. Cover the ball. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Good to meet you. All right. You're, you are a Sam Houston High School graduate. Yeah. Um, and and you said when you were 13, you kind of got the bug. Was there a teacher at Sam Houston who made a difference in your life at that time? Well, there were multiple teachers uh, along the way. And middle school was my science teacher who. Uh, and it introduced me to rocketry, which was kind of fun. And we actually created a flying saucer that I got to participate in. At Sam Houston, of course, there were a number of teachers that inspired me, and, and particularly in my chemistry teacher, my biology teacher. Uh, my math teacher was fun. I love math, but my favorite subject was science, of course, and that's why I ended up going to the So the teachers told you, yes, you can. Yes, and my mother, the ultimate teacher who taught uh, school for 45 years was my, my ultimate hero and mentor uh, that got me where I am today. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah, hey, everybody, Sam, you see Ah, yes. Soon. <laughs> That's what I want to hear. <laughs> good. As you heard, I went to Sam Houston High School, graduated many, many, many eons ago, and it's always nice to come, come back home, so I appreciate that. And thanks to the folks, my friends at Sylvan, uh, we have programs that we do together all, all across the country, focus on STEM. I understand you guys are part of, it's called P-TECH, can somebody tell me, what's what's the name of the program? Cybersecurity. Cyber okay, cybersecurity. And what do you do in cybersecurity? Working on malware, security. Malware. Okay. Cool. So you're getting ready to be the front line for cybersecurity and all the attacks and things like that that are happening as we speak. That's good. And guess what? If you do really well in this whole area, you're going to have good jobs, good paying jobs. So keep, keep up the good work. So I want to share a couple of things with you as I stand before you. I stand as an astronaut, as you heard. Uh, you heard that I also stand as a physician, so I'm a medical doctor. I did my residency after I did all the education that Joan uh, shared with you at the Mayo Clinic in internal medicine. Internal medicine is the uh, field of medicine that takes care of adults. What do you call the specialty that takes care of you at your age? Pediatrician. So I take care of anybody that's you know high school and, and beyond. And so uh, after I did that, then I also spent time at NASA, and I'm going to share with you what it's like to travel in space. I want to leave some time for you to ask some questions about that. But then when I left NASA, I got involved in uh, investments. So I started working in an industry called venture capital. Anybody heard of venture capital? I heard of that. Okay, the adults have. So I want to share with you because I, I did not know what a venture capitalist was. And that's what I am, one of the things that I've done, until I was like four years old and just now getting into the business. But let me tell you what a venture capitalist does. A venture capitalist goes and creates a company and then raises money for that company and create what's called a fund. And then that fund is used to invest in technologies. So the venture capital firm that I ran invests in medical technologies because I have a sort of medical background in my mission. And so we invested in an area called telemedicine. So the reason I bring that up is twofold. One, I want you to expose you to what venture capital is. But secondly, 
what you're doing in the cybersecurity area fits very nicely for the companies in which we invest in. Because telemedicine is using technology like, and I can't probably get to my iPhone. Let me see if I can pull it out of my pocket here. Oh, it's not in there. It's here. It uses this device to actually communicate with your doctor. So if you're sick, we have an app that you can log on using this device, the hour of the internet computer at home, and I can actually FaceTime with my doctor and tell the doctor what's wrong with me. And then the doctor can use this device to send a prescription to a pharmacy. And I even have to go and see the doctor face to face. So what do you think is would be critical about that interface? You know what interfaces are now, I'm sure. What would be critical? What would be critical? aspect of that interface related to what you are studying right now. Making sure somebody doesn't get a hold of the information. You got it. And use it for their own. Make sure that nobody gets a hold of the information. So medical information is probably one of the most critical forms of information that gets passed back and forth with this device, in addition to financial information, right? Because everybody is concerned about that. So encryption technology is really important for that. The only way that my company that does that can, can do that work is that we have encryption built in, into the device. But anyway, so that is uh, related to what you guys are doing. So let me ask a question of you. And I know in high school, because I was in high school, sometimes when the speaker picks on you, it's kind of like embarrass you, and you might not want to say anything. But I know this group. You guys are ready to speak up, right? So. Let me ask you, you know how to do that first. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do when you graduate from high school? What, what are you going to, what are you going to, what do you think about doing when you graduate from high school? You're not quite sure think about it? But you're into the cybersecurity thing. You got to do something around that? Okay. Does anybody know what they might want to do? Yes, sir? Go to military school. Well, go to college first and then go to the military. College first and then go to the military. Okay, cool. I saw your hand kind of peek up. No? You're just scratching your head. Anybody else want to be brave enough to share? All right, cool. Okay, so go to college, computer technology, right there you go into. All right, give me one more. How about a female? Person that might know what she might want to do. No? Yes? Come on, throw something out. I'm forcing you to think. Become a lawyer. Love it. I saw your hand. No telling. I, I saw you. <laughs> I know you thought you were scratching your nose, but what is it? Become a pediatrician. Pediatrician. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, as I said, I was in high school, believe it or not. I was in high school. And so I, I know that this may be difficult for you, uh, especially with all the cameras around you and, you know, don't staring you down and all that sort of thing. So even though you might have not raised your hand, I know for sure that you would not be in this school or in this special program if you didn't already know what you're thinking about. If you are not, don't, I want you to start thinking about it. So the, the reason for that question is to get you to think about what life is going to be like after high school. Because one day, I know this is going to be a shock to you, you're going to be as old as we are. <laughs> and you're going to have to be in a profession and be in a position to take care of yourself and to take care of your family and to give back to your community and participate in this nation. And we want to make sure that you have the tools necessary for you to do those things. That's why you're here. That's why the people around the room are investing in you. It's because we want to make sure that you're able to do those things. The reason why I tell you about all the things that I have done is because I believe that each and every one of you in this room have potential to do what I have done and even more things 
even greater things than I have done. You know the limiting factor? You know what would prevent you from doing that? You say you want to guess? Yourself. Uh, you got it. Get yourself. Get yourself. There's people that fear, interfere, and their aspirations many times. They're concerned about what your colleague may think if I say this or that, or if I share this, or they may you may think that you're not good enough for whatever reason. You might think if you're a woman that you can't be an engineer because you've only seen men being engineers, you can't be an astronaut because you've only seen men being astronauts, or you can't run a company because you've only seen white guys be CEOs of companies, guess what? None of that is true. That is all about limiting your mind, limiting who you are. I'm a person that's about no limits. No limits. And that should be your, your motto. In fact, we have a thing that we do in our company, and it's a saying that we have, and it goes like this, that we are infinite beings with infinite possibilities. That's what you are. You're an infinite being with infinite possibilities, meaning you can do anything that you want to do in life. And I know that it may not mean a lot to you, but I can tell you, if you take that in, if you if you really understand what that means about your potential, about your talents, and about the contributions that you should be making for yourself and for this nation, you are going to be fantastic. And one day you're going to be standing up here telling your story about how you finished exams in high school, and you did this or that, and young people are going to be looking up to you going like, isn't he crazy? Just like some of you might be saying. Right? But that's what it's about, at least about. So let me share with you in the few minutes that we have, and I want to open up for some questions. Uh, probably, uh, with all those things that I've done, probably the, the question I get asked most often is, what was it like to travel in space? Can anybody tell me what I, um, uh, what the vehicle was called that we used to go into space? Rocket ship. It's a rocket ship. Yep. What do we call that? Hang on, just a second. What do we call that? A rocket ship. <laughs> That's what he did. Right it was a rocket ship. What do we call that? Rocket ship. Yep, space shuttle. We have different names, right? They're different names. So we actually have five of them that we use to go into space. And I flew on two of them, Discovery and Columbia. You have seen that rocket ship that got before, but you may not know that it weighs five million pounds. In order to get that five million pounds in the air, we have to light five engines that produce a thrust of seven and a half million pounds. And with that thrust hitting the ground, we go in the opposite direction really quickly. You want to know how fast it takes us to get to orbit? In fact, I'm going to not tell you. I'm going to answer the question. How fast? Ten seconds. Oh, not that fast. Man, I wish we were that fast. <laughs> not quite that fast. Um, five minutes. Close. A little bit longer than five minutes. Three minutes. Actually, a little bit longer than five minutes. <laughs> Close. Eight, 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 eight and a half minutes. Eight and a half minutes from zero to being in space. Eight and a half minutes from lifting off at Cape Canaveral in Florida and blasting off and reaching 250 miles in space and some 5,000 miles down range. When I got out of my seat after liftoff, and looked out the window, I was looking at Spain and Europe, the European continent. That's how fast we began to travel. And I'd gone from zero to 17,500 miles an hour. And at 17,500 miles, miles an hour, I can go around the world every 90 minutes. I get to see a sunset or sunrise every 45 minutes. Why do you think I get to see a sunset or sunrise every 45 minutes? Yep, so the Earth, take it a little bit further. Earth orbits around the sun. Time is different. It is different. Because the sun orbit. goes hitting Earth. Like right? It's always hitting Earth. Yeah. Sometimes the sun is rising in the east and I'm rising in the west. Yeah. 
So the sun, so the Earth is orbiting, right? right. And then how, how long does it take? The, yeah, go ahead. Let me finish the question first, and then you can say it. Here we go. How long does it take the Earth to rotate? Uh, thank you. 24 hours. So, on an average, how many, uh, how much time do we have during the daytime and nighttime? 12 hours. Okay. And why do we call nighttime nighttime? Because it's dark. <laughs> because it is dark. I love it. It is. It's like white dark. But yeah, it's just dark. Same thing. So, same thing happens in orbit. Except for as the Earth is turning every 24 hours. It has day shining on it. It's determined by the rotation. If we are going around the Earth, we are also doing the same thing. We're just going much faster. So that's why you get 45 minutes of daytime and 45 minutes of nighttime. Okay. So once I got into orbit, it was really fun to be in a place that had microgravity, meaning that there's no gravity. I can float around. If I wanted to go from that side of the room to that side of the room, I just press with a little finger that goes cruising right across. And my first mission, though, I learned that when I push off from one place and go to the other one, I don't use my full hand. Because I use my full hand, that's too much force because I don't weigh anything. And because I don't weigh anything, all I need is a little finger. So I just a little light touch. And I just go cruising right across. So that when I got to the other side, I could just stop myself and then float in, in, um, wherever I am, at the front station or whatever. And so it's kind of, kind of cool being part of it. Because of that zero gravity, we actually are using being in space as a laboratory in which we can explore different things. So we do different experiments up there. We take animals up there to see how they behave. We do experiments on ourselves. And what we found in experiments of ourselves, that we lose 1% of bone per month. We lose 15 to 20% of our muscle mass, especially the muscles related to a standing, like our legs and our spine. We grow one to two inches when we're in orbit because of the unloading of our spine. We're not able to fight off illnesses. There are changes in the immune system. And our heart actually gets smaller space because it doesn't have to work as hard. So as a medical doctor, my job is to take care of the crew and my job along with my other crew members were to do experiments in that micrograph. That's what that's what we're doing in the International Space Station right now. So I wanted to give you a feel for what it's like to travel in space. I wanted to give you a feel for what it's like to kind of be in orbit. And in the few minutes that I have left, why don't I just open it up for questions that you might have. Yes, ma'am. What was your biggest challenge in high school? My biggest challenge in high school was trigonometry. Trigonometry. Can't even say it. That's how I, you know, I kind of had a flashback when you asked me that. It was math. <laughs> so I knew, though, I had to have math. So that was probably my biggest challenge. I love chemistry. I love biology. I love basic science. Anything to do with that. Math was a little tough for me. And I had to work hard. But I ended up doing, um, I think getting away all the way up to calculus out of high school with a quantitative analysis was a really good thing to get to college. So, yeah, that was a tough Yes, sir. Um, how did you, like, adjust yourself from going to a group of you being the majority and seeing more people like you to going to a group where you're the minority? Yeah, so um, are you talking about going to... Like going from high school to being around like people that look like you necessarily, mm -hmm. and then going to NASA, being in the workforce where there's not many people like you. So you probably don't know this, but back in the seventies, San Diego High School was mostly white. Oh, it? Oh. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. Because now it's mostly it's mostly white, right? So there were a lot of blacks, of course, and it was on the east side. Back my family then where am I? family lives in Eastwood Village. My father, that's where I kind of grew up in Eastwood Village, used to walk to San Houston. And um, so I had the experience. But to your point, I did get into environments where it was just me. For example, in my medical school class, I was the only uh, African American in my class. There were four or five of us in the entire school. When I went to astronaut school, I was quite sure what they call it. I was the only one in my class. And there were 
again, five of, no, four of us African Americans. And in the history of the space program, we've had about 23 African Americans out of around 400 or so astronauts who have been in space. So it's um, realizing who you are, is uh, realizing what your aspirations are, and being willing to work hard to accomplish those, despite what opposition may do. So it's making up that mind and making up your mind and being determined about accomplishing your goal. And you get it. Yes, sir. Do we take showers in space? We do. Uh, we don't. <laughs> I said we do. Let me tell you what, why I said we do and we don't. So we have a water dispenser. It's a little hose, and you can actually dial in the temperature of the water that you want. We don't have like a shower head that you get underneath. Because if we did, that water would come down and it would hit our bodies. And what do you think would happen? Water. Mm -hmm. It would hurt. When it hits your body, what do you think would happen when it hits your body? It falls off. What makes it fall off here on Earth? Gravity. Gravity. We're in a place with no gravity. Guess what happens? It comes out of the nozzle. It sticks to your skin. So the water comes out and it just hangs on your skin. And so I took advantage of that. To kind of take a quasi shower. So I turn the nozzle on and I just let it hit the center of my chest because I have a lot of uh, indentation right here. I let it fill up with water and I end up with this big water ball and it kind of looks, behaves like mercury. And if I move, it kind of moves like jello. And then I take no rinse shampoo and I put the no rinse shampoo inside that big bubble and then I take my hands and then I take a, by the way, I want to give you a full picture of it. Then I take that bottle. No rinse shampoo, and I just put it right there, and it just stays because it's zero gravity. And then I take my hand, and I reach it inside of that big bubble, and I move it around, and then suddenly this clear fungating mass, or this clear jello like stuff, turns into this big fungating mass, and I move it from place to place to place while I'm clean, and then I take a towel and put it on my body to absorb the water. I don't do like you do in the shower. You know, when your parents say, okay, you got to get out of the shower, let's go. You grab the towel and you brush it off real quick and you wipe yourself down. If I did that, soap and suds would be all over the place and everybody would be pissed off. Get okay. <laughs> in electronics and then you'll be destroyed. I have a question. Yes. How do you feel when you be in space and in quarantine? Would it be light? Would you go ahead? Yeah, how did it feel being in space? Whatever it is, you know, we spent six months in space now. And all of those changes that I talked about that happened to you, when we come back down, we have to go through a rehabilitation program because we're not able to stand up. So we're much weaker when we come, we come back. And in fact, with my longest flight being around two weeks, uh, even in that two week time period, that two week period, when I came back down, I could not stand up. It took me about 30 minutes where I could actually get up out of my seat and walk around. I had to get used to being in gravity. But I had to be careful in how I would walk around uh, during that day because I stumbled. One of the other things I did talk about is that your middle ear that tells you whether your right side or upside gets turned off. So if I'm standing here talking to you, just getting off of the spaceship, and I close my eyes, I would hit the ground and not know that I hit the ground until I hit the ground. Isn't that crazy? That's because my body is adapted to microgravity, and it turns off all of those systems that we normally use here. <coughs> yes, sir. Is our flag like the only flag that's been planted in the moon or is there more? Yeah, it's our flag, the only flag that's been in the moon. Uh, thus far, it is. Although China, I think, went to the far side of the moon. I don't know whether they put a flag or not. But we have a number of flags in many different areas uh, on the moon. And you can actually see them if you use a telescope, a powerful enough telescope. People always ask me, did we really go to the moon? So we get a telescope. Point out, you know, give a little map. You can actually get go to NASA, NASA.gov, find out where we landed, 
a large enough telescope, you can actually see the lunar landers and the places where we landed. And those marks are still on the surface of the moon, even though it's been over 40 years since the last. So there's steps? There. The steps are still there. And so your principal is standing up, and my communications guy is standing up telling me that we're right out of time. Nope, we're okay. We have they, all kinds of Oh, we got five minutes. But I'm not sure about yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know how to so here's my final question for you. Why are the, the footprints and the tire marks still on the moon? Yes, sir. There's no erosion. No erosion? Yeah. No wind. Why? No wind. What else? There's no water. You don't know? Close. Yeah, close. That's it. Say it's me. Don't be scared. No wind, no motion. All right. What else? There is no. That's. Oh, okay. Hold on. What? There's no weather up there. A lot of no weather. Exactly. You just cut to the chase. There is no weather. Here on Earth, we have weather, which is wind, rain, and everything else that goes to that. The only thing that can disturb the moon are meteors. They hit it every day. And the moon is that color. You see the big pock marks in it. And that comes from meteors hitting at various size, sizes for millions of years. Without an atmosphere, they just get buried. And so when you walk on the surface of the moon, you're actually walking on what feels like talcum powder. It's not even sand. Your foot disappears each step that you take. And it's because it's been beat, the surface has been beat for millions of years by microbeaters. All right, I'll come back to you. Yeah, that's how do you this is this is a glorious day. How do you sleep? How do you sleep? We have uh, sleeping bags that we use in space. Is that like little pods? Well, we have pods too. I've seen that In the International Space Station, they actually have separate quarters. You have separate quarters, so you've got a little space that's probably no bigger than, I'm serious, no bigger than this, maybe a little bit taller. And inside there, you have your sleeping bag attached to one side, maybe a little bit deeper, to one side of it. And then you have sort of your desks that you'll work on on the other side. And the sleeping bag has to be attached to the surface, whatever surface you have. So when I, on my first mission, we did not have the sleep station, so we just had the sleeping bags. We could just take the sleeping bags and I could put mine to the ceiling, or to the wall, or to the floor. And the most eerie thing that happened to me on that first mission is that I had to get up in the middle of the night to go pee. I'm sorry. You know, we have to do those things. And so when I woke up, I woke up and I unzipped my sleeping bag and I looked around and there were bodies floating in front of the direction. And I was on one side, and the bathroom was on the other side of the room. And so I had to float, get out of my sleeping bag, float through those bodies like a little snake going through, and then I got on the other side, and then of course I had to return without disturbing anybody. And I did it successfully. Nobody could have got out of it. Anyway, let me, uh, if I can, end with what I always like to, to end with, with... Uh, especially high school students, because you are on the verge of stepping out to take the helm of your life. And that is to remind you of the three things that are important. We, and actually, we have a little motto. I said it earlier. That we believe in infinite possibilities. That we are infinite beings with infinite possibilities. And what that means is that each and every one of you was born multi-potential with the ability to do anything that you want to do like anything you want to do. That was probably one of the first messages my mother told me. Number two, that each and every one of you born multi-talented, meaning that there are certain skills that you were born with. Some of you like science, some of you like math, some of you like playing sports, basketball, some of you sing, some of you might like, you know, whatever it is. It's nothing that you did or studied, you just like it. But then you can also use your brain, remember what this is, to learn different skills, different other talents and abilities. That's what school is about. So take advantage of that. 
And the last thing, number three, which is the most important thing, I typically like to share this with minority audiences, with people that look like me, and that is that each and every one of you were born for a reason. There is something special that you're supposed to do, and you're supposed to do, definitely you're supposed to do, and you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do. And you have to figure out what that is. Only you can figure that out. The folks around the room can help you, can assist you, can enable you, but those choices have to come from you. And you have to choose to do that. No matter what your colleagues next to you say, no matter what people might think about you or say about you, it, what counts is you. And there's another saying I'll just leave, and it has to do with success and accomplishment. Success is a choice. You guys heard this one? No. Success is a choice that you make. Not somebody around you, not your parents, not your principals, not your teachers. Achievement and success is a choice. And you have to make that choice. And I believe that choice you have to make now. Because that sets the stage for the choice. So this has been great. Thank you guys. You've been a great audience. Thank you. You didn't say anything the entire time I was sitting here. Why is that? <laughs> anyway, so I hope you guys remember at least some aspect of what I shared with you. So, yeah, thank you very much.